judges. Yep. Keep in the pedal board. <coughs> you good. We got time. We're not rushed, buddy. How we feeling? Oh, good. Okay. How we feeling? Uh, we guys, we guys, still working over there. That's okay. Hey, we'll just talk. Take your time. We understand it's a packed house. I'm grateful that y'all are here. You could be anywhere else in the world, but you're here, and for that reason, we're fired up. I'm excited. I missed live last week. Can you believe it? So I apologize for that. But I'm here this week and just fired up to be able to chat with you guys, open up God's word get into the Bible, and hopefully pray that God's word and his wisdom and his principles gets into us a little bit. But that can only happen. And this time, which is a very important time, can only be impactful if you do two things. Everybody say two things for me. Number one is recognize now is a really bad time to talk, play on your phone, or do anything but be totally locked in up here on the stage for the next little bit. If you can be locked in for me, give me a thumbs up. All thumbs, Giga Maggie's, shout out. Number two, and more importantly, so recognize now is even worse time to get up, use the restroom, or leave this room for any reason whatsoever because there's gonna be some really important principles impacted in the room, the last time in 2023, actually. There's gonna be some really important principles impacted in the room, and it's hard to be impacted by principles set in the room if you ain't in the room. So just make sure you take a seat, take a breather, a load off, and I promise you, I will respect your time if you respect me, I'm up here on the stage. If you do those two things for me, say, I got you, Nick. I want to talk to you guys today about the title of tonight's message. I'd write this down because what you write down is what you remember. The title, The Baby Who Changed Everything. The Baby Who Changed Everything. The baby being Jesus Christ in this case scenario. Jesus' birth. Lock in with me for a second. Jesus' birth brought an impact into this world that can only be described as indescribable. And this isn't just a historical insight, it's a portion of history, his story, that changes all of our stories. Isaiah 9, 6 even says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. C.S. Lewis even wrote this, the birth of Jesus is the central event in the history of the earth, the very thing the whole story has been about. This baby changed everything. Now look, I'm no stranger to a baby changing everything. Disregard that, it's just a phone. My phone case just broke though, but that's all right, disregard that. I'm no stranger to a baby changing everything. Last Tuesday, eight days ago, my son, Henry James Henderson, was born into this world. Uh, November, there he is. They say he looks like me. I'll let you be the judge of that. Why is he what? He's already flexing on him. He's already flexing on the people a little bit. Nah, all jokes aside, let me tell you. I'm beyond grateful. I could get emotional up here talking about it, so I'm gonna save that from you. But I, what I will say is that, man, we're just so blessed to be able to have Henry in our lives. But one thing is abundantly true. He has changed everything about our lives. My life specifically. I don't know, you know, not many of you know me personally, but if you do, you do know that I'm a very routine, like, based, try to be disciplined person. I like my, like, rhythms, you know? I don't know if, is anybody like that? You're just kind of like your routine. You don't like to, like, break the flow. You're just kind of like your routine. I'm like that. I've been like that since I was a, a teenager. The baby, yeah, it changes that. When it comes to sleep, I was like an eight to nine hours a night guy. Now I'm like one to two at any point in 24 hours, if I get a chance, I might just be falling asleep during my lunchtime. That's just how that works. When it comes to working out, I used to be like a two-a-day monster. Cardio in the morning, weights in the afternoon. Shout out LA Fitness. Now, it's like I'm going to try to today at some point maybe work out or maybe just get my heart rate up. Maybe just close my rings or get my steps in today. On a more serious level, it's changed the way that I see the world, the leisure my social media habits, my self-centeredness, all of those things have changed. And I've been eradicated, of course. I'm a work in progress like the rest of us. 
But I've just seen my life change so drastically in the last eight days with having Henry in our lives that this baby truly has changed everything. Everybody say everything. Thank you. There's always one. Jesus was the baby who changed everything for everyone. All of us in here are impacted by his existence because let me just lay this out for you. Jesus being born means this, that the God of the universe, the omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing God who exists in heaven decided to take on flesh and come down to the earth. And so all of a sudden, by virtue of Jesus' birth, the ideal became real, the impossible became possible, and my favorite one, the unapproachable, the God in which in the Old Testament people couldn't even look at him before being incinerated into dust, that God walked on the earth. The unapproachable became huggable through the birth of Jesus. He became so tangible. He became someone we could walk with in this earth. And I, my, I'm gonna say, I used to say that I want to save this for my points, but just in case you thought God was far off, just in case you thought like God doesn't really care about my issues, my problems, my things, I need to let you know today that God who exists in heaven has also existed on earth and also understands the things that you're going through and cares about them. We've talked about it at Fall Ride. There's nothing too big for God, amen, but there's also nothing too small. He sees you and he loves you and he understands you more importantly. But Jesus changed everything. It was his birth. Examples, he took over the timeline. He is by far the most famous historical figure to ever walk the face of the earth. He is the subject matter of the entire Bible. He was the example of perfection that no other, no other person could ever be. He lived the life we never could and died the death that we deserve, laying his life down, sacrificing his life for our sins. That it was his birth that reversed the curse of sin and death. That's who we're talking about. That's the, that's the monumental, massive impact that he made. Because he has forged a road to a life of freedom, redemption, and purpose for every single person here and who has ever lived. But beyond that, beyond the tweetable things and the items or all that stuff, is the narrative and the story that represents his birth in Matthew chapter one, the Christmas story, a lot of people call it, which is a beautiful one that includes a lot of practical wisdom. So I just thought that we'd open it up, look at Matthew chapter one, and I just wanna give you three facts from Jesus' birth story that I think would be helpful for us as we walk into the Christmas season, as we walk into the life today, the last live, the three final points of live 2023. Let's write them down, let's apply them to our lives. Number one, first fact is his bloodline was filled with broken people. His bloodline was filled with broken people. Matthew 1, 1 through 16 describes Jesus's bloodline, his lineage. And in the Bible, if you wanna learn something here, it's called a genealogy. It's basically like, who are your, who are your grandparents, your great-grandparents, your great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents? Like, where did you come from, Jesus? And here's one thing you may assume. Savior of the universe? Well, I bet his lineage is full of legends, beasts, studs, people who are perfect, people who never messed up, made a mistake, or have perfect pedigrees. That's not him. That's not where he comes from. In fact, the only thing people have in common when it comes to his lineage is the fact they all had faults. But even in their faults, they all pointed to the God in the flesh. Let me give you some examples. And I'd encourage you to open up Matthew 1 if you have your Bibles today. If you're looking at it, you'll see people in there like Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute. Bathsheba was part of an affair. David was the one who perpetuated that affair and murdered someone to cover it up. Solomon slept around and Ruth wasn't even Jewish. She was from another country. Jesus came from a long line of outsiders, sinners, mistakes, mishaps, mess-ups, outlaws, scoundrels. And when he entered into the world, he entered into the messiness of the human family. Can anybody relate to a, maybe a messy family where things aren't what they should be? Where people may perceive you like, oh, two parents together, same house, I'm sure it's great, but you know. You know. Or maybe you're coming from a family like that. Jesus gets you. The messiness of the human family. And what was interesting is that he was the only member of this family tree that didn't bring shame upon the family, but instead he would be the one who took upon the shame on himself for every single person in that family tree and every single person here tonight. Meaning this for you. There were people who were really messed up in the direct line of his descent. And maybe this is the practical wisdom for all of us here today. Is that it's not about 
where you're from or who your family is that dictates your future. It's all about where you're headed. And maybe this will help you. I would write this down. Broken trees don't always breed bad apples. Broken trees don't always breed bad apples. What do you mean by that? A lot of times you kind of hear the phrase, well, apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Like if Henry starts, you know, lifting weights and just being like a really smart person and really athletic and really strong and, you know, have really good qualities, they'd probably say like apple doesn't far, far, fall far from the tree, right? That's kind of like a thing that people would say. You know what I'm saying? You guys agree with that, right? All right, whatever. But that's the saying. But the idea being this is that your family may be broken in many ways. Maybe you live in a separated household. Maybe you live in a situation in which you wish your household was separated. Maybe you're like me and you've lost a parent. I come from a broken home too and I get it. But I'm telling you this, that your family background does not dictate your future or where you're going or where you're headed in life. I'm telling you this right now. I don't know what your relationship with your siblings looks like. I don't know what your relationship with your parents looks like. But I'm telling you right now that it doesn't have to make you leave you high and dry in life because your family isn't what you think other people's family is. Jesus is the best example of this, where a bloodline of pure brokenness is what he's coming off of and ends up being the savior of the world. Trust in the fact that God is the God of the turnaround, that he intends to turn your situation, your situation around along with every other situation you have in your life. And your family tree is just one of those situations. And so I'm telling you, because when God decides to intervene, it matters less about what your grandparents, your mother, your dad did, and all about who your heavenly father is. God does not dictate your life based on your background. It's based on his will and your obedience. But speaking of his family, his mom, Mary, was the, an amazing example of obedience and trust in the Lord. And she had to go through the absolute fire to prove her faithfulness. Because in number two, his conception almost destroyed Mary's reputation. His conception Mary's being pregnant with Jesus, almost destroyed her reputation. A little part of the story that you may not understand is that the big deal about the Christmas story is that it's a virgin birth, right? Is that they didn't have to do the things that make people pregnant. She was part of the miraculous conception and was pregnant with Jesus without being in human relations with a man. That's kind of the point, right? That's kind of what makes this like the Christmas story is that fact. And that sounds really cool and spiritual and normal unless you're her man. Now listen, I don't know about you, but if I have a significant other tell me that they're pregnant, I'm assuming one thing. Mary goes to Joseph, says, I'm pregnant, but I haven't slept around with anybody. Huh, interesting how that works, the Holy Spirit, huh? Real convenient. So convenient, actually. I think it's in verse 20. It goes down a little bit into the 20s. Verse 18, rather. It gets at how Joseph contemplated how to best separate, for her, separate from her on the low. Like, okay, look. At the least, he thinks she's crazy. At the most, she thinks she's sneaky, conniving, ill-intentioned person. He's like, all right, we got to end this. And then the Lord speaks to Joseph too and tells him, hey, yo, like, it's good, right? And to pile it on, maybe bring this into your context, Mary at the time was only 14 to 17 years of age. That's a high school student. Go with me for a second. Can you imagine the slander and the gossip that would happen in your school halls if this happened? We're talking about a reputation here. We're talking about staying strong in the will of God. Can you imagine the talk that would be around the town if this happened. You guys got me here? For Mary, that was a given. And for her, she had to navigate that. And she had to deal with that. And she had to figure out, okay, how am I gonna live for God when everybody thinks at the least I'm crazy, at the most I'm a sinner who's cheated on my fiance? How do I navigate that? Here's what you need to know. When people lack context in God's call for your life, they either go three things, conceited, confused, or critical. Conceited like, I'm better than you. Confused like, what's wrong with you? Critical as in, why are you doing that? Either way, it's typically not applause. 
So don't expect people to always cheer you on. Don't expect people to always be grateful that you invited them to church. Don't expect people to always be cool with the fact that you're not going to those parties anymore, that you don't do the stuff that you used to, that you don't listen to the stuff, that you don't talk the way that you used to before you met Jesus, got baptized, and started doing the Christian thing. Don't expect it because it's probably not going to happen. People might not appreciate your prayers. People might not appreciate you sharing scripture with them. People might unfollow you on Instagram when you start posting about your live notes all the time. Hello, welcome to the world. When people don't understand God's call in your life, they get conceited, confused, or critical of you. And here's the thing. Jesus, didn't prob- Jesus did not promise that everybody would love you. He just promised that he would always love you. He did not guarantee they'd have everybody else's approval. He just promised you that you would always have his mercy, grace, forgiveness, and ability to live life by his strength and not your own. And the hard truth is this. Sometimes when Christ comes into our lives, it's not always easier or better. That you might be suffering, stressed out, and dealing with the negative consequences of life right in the middle of God's will. It's like, what? I thought if I did everything right, I thought if I was obedient to God, then my life would go well. I thought if I read my Bible, then I would make the varsity squad. I thought if I read my Bible and prayed and showed up to church, I would get A's in my classes. My life would kind of start to, get, start to come together. No, in fact, you may get saved, baptized, read the Bible, show up to church, and all of a sudden your girlfriend breaks up with you. All of a sudden your friends leave you. All of a sudden your life gets worse. Why? Because Pleasure nor suffering are signs that you're off the path. Obedience doesn't necessarily come with either one of those things. And Jesus is the best example of that. Jesus lived God's will out to a T, but yet he died the death that he did not deserve. In fact, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying, he's like, Lord, if you can let this cup pass, if you can make it to where I don't go to the cross and die for all of humanity, I would really appreciate that. And God's like, well, thanks for asking, You're going to go ahead and go to the cross. And the person who lived the best life, who's ever lived, went to the cross and died the death that he did not deserve. So what about us? As we obey, as we are obedient. God has not promised us a great life. He's promised us a meaningful, purposeful life, and that in which we are proud to live. So acknowledging that, acknowledging that, that Christ came into this world in the mundane in the misery, in the difficulty, with a lack of luxury, and hype. In fact, a practical point here, number three, the last one, his name at the time was not unique. His name at the time was not unique. Verse 25 says they named him Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus' name was like an incredibly common name, like Josh, or like Bailey, or John, or... Taylor or like Aaron or some other basic name like that, you know, like some other low key, super normal, not like crazy cool. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I just mentioned Taylor. But all jokes aside, hey, if you can hear me, clap once for me. Sorry. Let me bring you back. That's on me. It was that common name. Jesus. One of the mill no hype to it, that would come to be known as the name above all names. That would be the name that many of you have said, Jesus, I need you in my life. When we baptize you, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Son, Jesus. Please, Jesus, help me with this. Please, Jesus, I need this. Praying, seeking, looking for salvation, looking for hope, going to that name, that's what it will become. That's what it will become. Because there's nothing flashy about him on the surface. But he wasn't just a baby named Jesus. He was God wrapped in flesh, walking amongst his very own creation. And you need to just hear this. God came into our world. So that way, by putting our faith in him, we could one day live in his world, in heaven. And that's what makes him so great. Was his humility to stoop to our level that makes his greatness. It doesn't diminish it. A lot of people say, well, if God's so great, why would he come and be a human? If God's so great, why would he go to earth? Be a person like you and me, why would he do that? Shouldn't he kind of stay on his throne like a good leader does? No. The best leaders operate in humility, are willing to stoop low to do the things that they're called to do.
I'll give an example of this. Our teaching pastor, Dave Briggle, is one of my favorite people in the world. He's the guy who speaks on Sunday mornings. You probably see him speaking on the stage, doing a great job. He's a great speaker, an even better person, a great leader, a great boss. But I'll tell you why. It's not necessarily because Big Rig has great sermons, which he does. It's not because he's a great boss, which he is. It's because of his humility. Let me tell you a story. I was driving out in front of the church one day, and I look in the parking lot, kind of in our grassy area over here, and Dave Riggle, our teaching pastor, big stage guy, is just picking up trash. Papers, cups, you know, place just gets a little messy. It's a big place. Cups, different things off the ground, different things people just left behind after a day of church or, you know, a week, and he's just picking it up. And you know what? Driving by, you know what I didn't think? Look at this lowly loser over here picking up trash, right? Look at this guy wasting his time over here. Man, that's so lame that he's doing that. That's not what I thought. You know what? I thought the complete opposite. What an amazing leader to have the humility to stoop low, to do the lowest activity. When he, he's always speaking on stages, but also when he comes off the stage, says, I'm gonna, I just gotta pick up trash. In the same way, our Lord in heaven, all powerful, all knowing, says, I'm gonna step into your world, your family, your situation. The simple world that we operate in, the pain, the death, the issues, the stress. I'm gonna step into that to understand you. And you know what we don't think? Well, God's so low for doing that. No, it doesn't diminish his greatness, it makes it. It's what makes him great. C.S. Lewis says it this way, that the son of God became a man to enable men and women to become sons and daughters of God. He didn't delegate it, he did it himself. Why? Because he wants you in his family. Look, I don't know what brought you here tonight. I don't know if you just came here for the Christmas lights or whatever, but I'm telling you that there's someone that you need to meet and his name is Jesus. You may be in here and you're like, I've been trying to behave my way into heaven, but I'm telling you, it's less about your behavior and all about trusting in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, about committing your life to him, by giving your life over to God. To, to Jesus, the baby who brought grace, forgiveness, and love that we can never earn ourselves. That it's not about climbing or trying or our effort, but all about embracing his grace. And you can have that grace tonight. You can commit your life to Christ and have surety in your salvation and clarity in your life as a whole. Let's bow our heads across the room for a second. If you're here tonight, you hear me talking about Jesus, about having a relationship with Jesus, but you're here and you're like, I don't know. I feel like you're talking to me. I, I don't know if I have a relationship with God. I don't know if I'm good with God. I'm not even 110% sure that I'd go to heaven when I die. I don't know. If you feel like I don't know, if you're like, no, or I don't know, on the count of three, I just want you to put your hand up and right back down as quickly as you can. Nothing crazy. Just so you know, like, you're confirming to yourself, I don't know, on the count of three, if you don't know. One, two, three, hand up and right back down. See your hands all over the room. That's you. You're like, hey, that's me. Hands up and right back down. You're confirming, okay. I don't think I know. You can know right now. By praying this prayer after me, by committing your life to Christ, you can be 110% sure, sir, certain that you are good with God, that you're going to heaven when you die. It's not the prayer that saves you, it's the commitment to Christ that does. So if you just put your hand up and write back down, I want you to pray this prayer to yourself after me. God, I'm sorry for the mistakes I made, but I'm thankful that you love me anyways. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins today. I commit my life to you. Now look, I'm asking you something bold when I count to three. Is to put your hand up and look at me. I'm not gonna make you stand up, go anywhere or do anything like that. I know some of you have been to different services. It's not that night. I just want you to look at me so you can confirm to yourself in this large room, like, hey, I made this decision. And Nick, I want you to know that I made this decision. So if you prayed that prayer for the first time, committing your life to Christ, on the count of three, I want you to put your hand up, elbow above your ear, and look right at me on the count of three. One, be bold. Two, this is your moment. Three, right now, come on. I see you, I see you, that's awesome. I see you, I see you guys right there, that's awesome. I see you, I see you, I see you. If you looked at me, like I said, I'm not gonna make you go anywhere, but here in a little bit, there's gonna be people up front during this next song. People who wanna pray with you. 
for everyone here in this room, but especially if you rose your hand and looked up at me, come talk to us. Come let us pray for you. Come let us encourage you because what you just made is the best decision you'll ever make. Inviting Christ into your life, inviting purpose into your present, and inviting hope into your future. Father, we're so thankful. We love you. And we're grateful for this time, for the Christmas season, to celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus. We pray, Lord, that we worship with the tenacity, with the passion, with the love for you that identifies, that reflects the love you have for us. It's in Jesus' power for me to pray. Amen. Y'all worship with us.